Hello everyone, this is Shadowman. You're watching update 3 of my Kinex 8-bit mechanical computer, and in this update we'll be covering the ROM, instructions and how they're fetched, and the jump section. In the last video we discussed the RAM, which is right here, and how data is transferred from one location to the other. And in update 1, I talked about the ALU, which is at the front of the computer. I'm at the back of the computer right now, and this is the ROM area, which will store instructions. It is behind the RAM. I included a small gap right here just so I could have control lines and other mechanisms. Here's a view from the side where you can see the main structure and how it's attached to the rest of the computer. What is this area all about? Well, in those other two update videos, I was pushing and pulling control lines manually and turning motors on manually to do data transfers and ALU operations, but the final computer is going to do all of those things automatically, and the instructions are what will control all of that. The computer will perform one simple instruction at a time. Each instruction will contain the ones and zeros necessary to make the computer do a simple command, such as add or subtract. And as you might have guessed, we have each instruction stored in 8 bits. Since this is a read-only memory, rather than a random access memory, we don't need to have a way for the computer to write data. Instead, all of these will be manually set at the beginning, and that will essentially be how I input programs into the computer. So each one of these ROM slots, I'll have to go through and individually set bits to either zero, like this, or one. This particular design also works a little bit different from the RAM. Instead of reading and then lifting up all of the bus lines, instead this one will just move forward like this. And I'm just operating this by hand right now. And all of these instruction bus lines will just be up by default. And if I put a 1 in here, it's going to be hard to do one-handed. But if this was up right now, it would be blocked by that orange connector being in that position versus a 0, because this would just allow it to go down. And so any of them that are stuck in a position like this, that will be a 1. And any of them that go downward, that will be a 0. It's really important in a computer for these instructions to always execute in a certain order. Usually they will just go starting with this first one and then go up a level each time to the next one. But it might also jump around as well, depending on what the program is telling it to do and the computer must fetch the next instruction when one instruction is finished. And that's what I mean by the instruction fetch cycle. And all of that is controlled by this rather large area on the side here. Coming down to the bottom of the computer, this goes down to about here. And like lots of the other sections, it really just involves a motor that is always on. And we have a transmission right here that will control whether the output is on or off. Whenever we want to turn this on, it will simply rotate 360 degrees and then turn itself off, much like lots of the other sections. And we will turn this on whenever the computer is to move to the next instruction. Using the jump section, which is over there in the front side, the computer will know whether to move to the next instruction above the current one, or to jump to an instruction anywhere in the program. And then the motor will activate a crank that will lift this up automatically. You can see the transmission used for the data transfer cycle right there, right next to this one. And this one is a slightly different design, and I really like this one because it uses a differential what it does is it has one input that is always on, and then it will choose between one of two outputs. So much like the other ones, normally nothing will happen. It will simply spin the differential like that on the inside, but the actual differential itself stays still. But when I want to activate it, it will spin just for 360 degrees, and allow the instruction fetch cycle to occur. 
In order to understand the entire instruction fetch cycle, we need to start with the two different scenarios that the computer will come across during program execution. Normally, we'll have a regular instruction such as add or subtract or move data. And with those, after the instruction is finished, the program will just increment to the next one. So we'll call that the increment scenario. This increment will happen all the way from the first instruction to the last one, which will be instruction number 16, and then the program will stop. The other scenario, though, is that if we are at, say, instruction number 2, and we want to jump to instruction number 9 all of a sudden, right after instruction 2 is finished, that would be a jump scenario, and that's what the jump section in the front controls. Whenever the computer determines that it needs to jump, this right here will turn like that. Ultimately, when the next instruction is fetched, this right here, most of these will be deactivated like this one is right now, but one of them will activate and then it will push that up. So now we know the two different scenarios. Whether we are jumping or incrementing, we are going to have a weight that falls. This is for incrementing, and this weight over here that's up is for jumps. And since this is just one ROM byte, we'll have two weights for each of these, and eventually there's going to be 16 levels of this. Whenever one of these weights falls down, that will activate that instruction. First, I'll explain the increment, since that's a little bit simpler. When we increment instructions, all the computer has to do is figure out which instruction is active, turn that one off, and then turn the one above it on. When we want to fetch the next instruction with an increment, first we need to unlock these weights, and only one of them will fall down, and then we will reset the weights back up. We've seen we need to lock and then reset, so in the cycle, it comes off of this shaft right here, and this is basically just a camshaft. First we will lift this up, and then it will lift the resetter up. This one right here will undo the lock, and this one will reset the weights. So when I activate this, we can see one activate after the other, and then it turns off. To unlock one of the weights, either the increment or the jump, we need to turn this, and like I said, this is what the computer will do when it knows it needs to jump. So normally, by default, it will be over there, and that's just in the increment. And when it wants to jump, it slides over like that to the other side. And this is much like some other areas where it selects between one of two outputs, given one input. So when it moves this up, this is connected to an arm that unlocks this set of weights. Like that. Then when we want to reset, this right here is hooked up directly to reset both sets of weights, whichever one fell. The jump is a little bit more complex, but it's essentially the same thing. But before I do that, let's talk about my new office setup. I've really improved my home office with the addition of the FlexiSpot E7 Pro standing desk. Since I both work from home and use tables for building, being able to have a solid workspace with adjustable height provides health benefits and flexibility while working on different projects, whether I'm on the PC or making Kinex contraptions. Assembling the desk is a lot easier than building a mechanical computer. The items come easy to unpack and no additional tools are required. I mean, look at this thing. First, the tabletop and top frame are attached, then the two motorized legs, and then the electrical is hooked up. A magnetic cable cover is provided, so there won't be cables getting in the way. After flipping the desk around and plugging it in, it's ready to be raised and lowered right away. This desk is very heavy and sturdy, so it performs well even at its max height of 50 inches. A great feature is memory, which lets you save up to 4 heights by pressing the M button, and then one of the memory buttons to save. Then pressing one of those powers the desk to the exact height with one button press. 
With a 440 pound load capacity, the desk works even with the heaviest office setups. Perfect. There is also a locking feature that prevents unwanted use by children, which is good for safety. The desk movement is so smooth that even stacked connectsmen don't fall over. Watch this. Nice, they didn't even move. Head over to flexispot.com to customize and buy your E7 standing desk today. They're having a huge sale right now. There are links to this website in the video description. All right, now back to the computer. The next instruction to jump to is controlled by this selector. And as we saw in update two, each of these connects to a byte of RAM directly to select or unselect it. And there's only one that is selected at a time. So we can do the same thing for the instructions since they're at the same level. The instructions, however, can't be connected directly to the selector or else doing a RAM operation will mess up the program. We have some pins on this side and only one of these pins will be up. Right now it's the first one, but if I go to the next one, we'll see that pin goes down and this next one is up. And when a pin is down, it's blocking this weight from going down so that instruction won't be jumped to. So if I wanted to jump back down to this first instruction, I would just set all of these to zero. That pin is up and this weight will be unblocked when it gets unlocked. The way this unlocks is a lot like the other one, except it's kind of harder to see. That will be pushed out like this. We can see that weight just fell. Where it gets more complex is even though we just activated a certain instruction, the original instruction would still be active. So we must first, before we let that weight fall, reset all the instructions back to the inactive position. That's done with this red connector in here. If one of the instructions is active like this, this red connector will push it back to zero like that. This reset occurs as soon as this first one starts lifting up. And then when it gets to the top, that's when those weights are unlocked. To demonstrate, let's make sure this first instruction is not active like it is right now. Make sure that zero is selected up here. And then turn on jump mode by making sure this is this way. As you can see that both activated and then it went back up and now this instruction is active. Now we know how the instruction fetch cycle works, whether we increment or jump, but how does the computer determine whether to jump or whether to activate this or not? That is done with the jump section in the front. The computer will jump or maybe not when it comes across a jump instruction. The jumps are not unconditional. They depend on the conditions of the ALU flags. As we reviewed in the first video, a result from the ALU will activate certain flags, like the zero flag or the negative flag. This will help the computer be able to execute programs and only do certain sections if certain conditions are true. For example, if one of the numbers is greater than five, then jump to instruction number nine. If not, then just continue to increment. The jump instruction then will mainly be used after the ALU operation occurs, so we'll get our result from the ALU and then the computer will determine whether we need to jump. This jump section is really complex looking, but it's really just a bunch of AND gates, several AND gates for each jump instruction. When all the conditions are true on one of these, then it will activate our jump control line and the fetch cycle will know to do a jump. In order to process all these ALU flags in an organized way, I am using four different jump instructions and that 
corresponds to these four weights right here. The four different jump instructions we have are jump if carry, jump if zero, jump if less than zero, and jump if greater than or equal to zero. Right now, jump if negative is selected, but the result is actually positive. So if I activate the jump section, we can see that nothing fell. So now the computer will just do a normal increment. Since there are four different jump instructions, we actually should only select one of these or else bad things will happen. We have two sliding plates. Each one is actually hooked up to the same control lines that select data transfer since we're never going to do a data transfer and jump instruction at the same time, so we can use the same control line. So we have one coming up here that can slide this plate like that. And you might remember from the second video that that also controls the data transfer operation. Same thing with this one back here. The plates are really difficult to see, but they're essentially right next to each other. So we can see that one sliding right here. And this one's sliding right here. And the actual pins are located underneath here. So we can see that that white rod can either block that orange connector or it can slide out of the way and let it fall downward. Let's say the result actually is negative, so we can do this. And now we have the jump if negative selected. So when we activate the jump this time, we can see it falls down. And that is attached to that jump line that I was rotating manually in the back. We can see it a little better from the side. So if I do this manually, we can see when a jump is activated, those yellow connectors go down and all of this is connected all the way to the back. So we could see that push down on the yellow connector and that just did our jump control line. When we want to reset everything, the computer will just reset using the jump control line like that. And then of course, after that, this whole jump section will be reset like that. This whole bottom section is just for locking these four jump rods in the up position. So we can see that they are locked and prevented from going down like that. But when I do that, the jump of negative just activated and slid all the way down. And we can reset it like this. And then to reset it all the way, you push it up like that. Would you look at that? I decided to build four bytes of ROM so that I can show off this increment section better. And the official term for incrementing is actually the program counter. So that's what I'll call it from now on because it counts up one instruction at a time. So that was going from the first instruction to the second one. That about covers everything in this video. In the next one, update four, we're going to have all these individual instruction bus lines connected to control lines throughout the computer, such as this one right here that activates the jump section, the one down there that turns the ALU on, and others. At that point, we'll actually be able to step through programs, which is pretty exciting. You'll also notice that in the video title, I've come up with an official name for this computer, Mechadigit 1. That stands for Mechanism Digital Computer, and I gave it that name to describe what kind of mechanical computer this is, made out of mechanisms and it's digital rather than analog. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.